Hellions number 5 is the 6th chapter in X-Men Ten of Swords, and it's the funniest chapter in the entire Dawn of X. Frankly, one of the funniest X-Men comics I think I've ever read. It's certainly not the most important part of Ten of Swords, but by issue's end, I'm definitely leaning towards calling Hellions the best non-Hickman book in Marvel's X-Men lineup. Today I'll answer, what's the Hellions' role in the Ten of Swords event? What do we learn about Mr. Sinister's black market clone farms in this sinister heavy issue? And what's Jamie Braddock doing as King of Avalon? on over there in Otherworld where all the action in Ten of Swords is taking place, plus some theories and predictions for what's to come. Hey everybody, I'm Dave Busing, founder and editor-in-chief of ComicBookHerald.com. You are listening to Crack and Krakoa number 101. Everybody, definitely thank you for listening. If you have comments, theories, let me know in the, the comments here. And of course, as always, if you like the Comic Book Herald YouTube channel or Crack and Krakoa, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing. Writer Zeb Wells, artist Carmen Carnero, colors David Curiel, letters Ariana Maher. Opens with Manuel De La Rocha's Resurrection prior to X Factor number four, clearly, when we saw Resurrection Protocols taken off the table in the Tennis Swords event. And of course, Manuel, as always, is the absolute worst. Now, he, of course, doesn't remember what happened to him, but as Hellions readers, we know that he was shot in the head early, I think, in Hellions issue number two on their very first mission to clean up one of Sinister's clone farms back in one of his old orphanages. Uh, Manual, for those of you who are less familiar, he is one of the original Hellions, and he has the power to manipulate emotions, which he uses really without abandon. Here he gets uh, some egg goo on Professor X, and then is just a, a general jerk to Hope Summers. To think that this was potentially one of Krakoa's last resurrections before things went awry is, of course, supposed to hit us in the gut a little bit. We jump then to a quiet council meeting where Mr. Sinister's plan is to send the Hellions to steal the swords so Arako can't use them and force a forfeit. This is actually a really great fit for the Hellions as a team. You know, I've been wondering and kind of kind of offering some conjecture on what the team's role might be in this event, and it goes to show how scared the Quiet Council is of the events of Ten of Swords. And I think just to clarify too, like none of the Hellions are actually any of the champions um, of, you know, in this tournament. So they're not fighting in it, so they have this additional role to try and mess with Arako essentially. Importantly, and, and essential to this issue, Mr. Sinister is hilarious. Absolutely, I would say the funniest we've seen the character. I've heard it said that Karen Gillan's Mr. Sinister walked so Hickman's could run, but really all of that was so that Zeb Wells could soar, and that's what we see in Hellions number 5. Defining comedy is one of the surest ways to ruin the joke, yet I think it's absolutely worth highlighting the craft on display in this issue, as selling belly laughs in an X-Men comic is no small feat. Truly, I laughed out loud multiple times, and that is a rarity for me reading superhero comics. The obvious highlight is Wells' pacing and dialogue. Sinister calling Doug Ramsey the weird kid who smells like milk is a killer line, as is him telling, you know, Emma Frost somebody should tell her face as an aside, but only focusing on the jokes themselves undersells the importance of Carmen Carnero's facial expressions and layouts, as well as secret weapon Ariana Maher's lettering using the small font asides frequently in this, an explosive the floor was mine Bennett's when the situation arises. Wells, as a writer, is coming off comedic works like Peter Porker, The Spectacular Spider-Ham, so the ability to write comedy this strong shouldn't be a shock, and Hellions has had pretty good laughs throughout, but Hellions number 5 as a whole is absolutely on another level. Of course, for all Sinister's bluster and scheming, his arrogance gets the best of him when he taunts Magneto into voting to send him with the Hellions into Otherworld on this Steal the Swords journey the team is going on. Despite Sinister's apparent absolute fear of being lost to Otherworld, which plays to his nature, right? He's a very self-centered being. I'd actually guess this is intentional, and he's tricking Magneto into voting to send him for one reason or another. There must be something Sinister wants in Otherworld. I think he's actually intentionally getting himself sent there, even though it looks otherwise. Because actually, you know, if you think about it, the Quiet Council does not, at least in theory, Professor X certainly doesn't, want to send mutants in general, or definitely members of the Quiet Council, to this location where they might be lost for all time or might come back completely altered. I think it's important to remember, and this is something I've been forgetting lately in Ten of Swords, is that Otherworld can mean quote, this sort of quote-unquote final death, but it actually, with Rockslide, remember, he was resurrected. He's just an amalgamation of all Rockslides across, like, the Omniverse. So they come back, they're just, they come back changed, potentially. And while Sinister might not be interested in that, there might be things in Otherworld he is interested in. For example, the DNA of Omega-level mutant Absalom Mercator, who, you know, we talked about as potentially being in Otherworld based on the name of one of the realms there. So prior to waltzing into Otherworld, Sinister is completely uncertain 
unsurprising black market cloning is revealed. Now, Sinister running an illegal clone farm in his basement is a pretty safe assumption, and although I initially thought I saw different mutants in his crystals, they do all appear to be Sinister clones on Bar Sinister. At least from this imagery, you know, I don't necessarily see, like, his Jean Grey or his Cyclops or anything like that. It doesn't mean they're not there. At this point in the story, Sinister is basically in It's Always a Doombot territory, where unless very specifically made clear it's the one real mutant Sinister, it's probably a clone. And even then, later, if a writer wants, it can be revealed to have been a clone the whole time, right? Like, it's always a strong possibility that we're not dealing with the one true Sinister. So, I'm less interested in whether or not the real Sinister is the one venturing into Otherworld. It, it's left up to mystery here based on the outcome of a rock, paper, scissors game we don't get to see. Um, but I, I'm more interested in how his black market clones impact the notion of Krakoan resurrection. If you remember, you know, we've seen recently in Hellions number four that Krakoa seemingly has the capacity to resurrect clones. But in the case of Madeline Pryor, they just opted not to. You know, they essentially uh, decided that she was too dangerous and, and too similar, I think, in Jean Grey in some capacity. So this gives the implication that Sinister's clones can be resurrected, right? Like if something happened to one of to Sinister, it, one of his clones could be the one that actually went through the resurrection protocol. As Resurrection is very much up in the air in Ten of Swords event, these wrenches, you know, in the whole proceedings become increasingly interesting to me. You combine now a possible Sinister clone getting resurrected with the Otherworld implication of all of their alternate reality versions getting, you know, resurrected with them. You could have a situation where you have a real Sinister still out there as himself of Earth 616 and a clone that gets resurrected as this weird alternate reality amalgamation. That Sinister, I feel like, you know, experimentally would be very interested in seeing what that version of that character looks like to make matters more interesting sinister offers jamie access to black market clones in exchange for his help and passage through avalon before he loses his cape for a horse he doesn't even want of course the sequence is extremely engaging primarily because we have no idea really what jamie braddock a mega level reality warper is really doing in avalon aside from creating alternate realities that sustain a captain britain core made of jubilee gambit rogue and richter aka team excalibur in fun british flag outfits there's an intriguing loyalty to Saturnine that Jamie displays here, which I find at odds with both his personality, he's very chaotic, and his status as Apocalypse's chosen king of Avalon. Apocalypse, of course, has been very directly at odds with Saturnine. I suspect there's a lot more hiding under the table here, and maybe a black market clone of Jamie allows him to really go wild with his reality warping business without fear of losing his actual real self to Saturnine's wrath, right? Maybe Jamie does have a little bit of fear that Saturnine's power, which we've seen as kind of the ultimate, you know, that we've ever seen from her, that we've really seen in Otherworld, you know, she holds the armies of Araco, the Horsemen, the Children of Apocalypse, and the Krakoan army at bay with, you know, a snap of her fingers, essentially. Maybe Jamie does have some real fear there, but but he can think, well, if I can trick her, if I can kind of run out this ruse with a black market clone, maybe I can get away with more of this alternate reality type stuff that I've been planning. I think we could see that developing in the pages of Excalibur to come, or at least I hope so, because I want to see more from what Jamie's doing. So as far as what the team does, I mean, they don't really accomplish anything here other than getting to uh, Otherworld and going on their adventure. Uh, Empath, you know, he won't help the team. Uh, again, they're completely dysfunctional. He won't follow Sinister's orders unless he's, quote unquote, allowed to take great Crow as his pet. Uh, Sinister <laughs> really has no reservations and acquiesces, and we le lean into now Grey Crow as the comedic sidekick of Empath, who again is the worst at all times. As Quanon tells Mr. Sinister, this one's going to end badly, and Mr. Sinister then shouts, don't they all, laughing hysterically and riding off towards the uh, the mountains of Otherworld on his horse. I mean, all things considered, this issue is a riot. It's so good. It's so much fun. It's such a nice change of pace to for Tennis Swords, you know, this is an event that is quite serious, and I suspect, you know, additional issues will take a relatively serious tone as well, and Hellions gives us a breather from that while simultaneously having a fun role. You know, I'm curious to see what this team's actually going to do as they, or not do, as they, you know, venture into this territory and try to, to mess with Arako to throw this tournament off balance. So up next, we have the Krakoan Reeds Warlock, which is, of course, a reference here to the New Mutants number 13 issue coming next is Chapter 7 
in the Ten of Swords, Doug going to be wielding the Warlock Blade. I'm excited to dig into that one. That'll be Cracking Krakoa number 102 coming here next on the channel. Hey, if you want to hear that and you want to see everything that's going on with Ten of Swords in my coverage here, please like and subscribe to the Comic Book Herald channel where I will be covering uh, pretty much every X-Men comic that's coming out in the Dawn of X and definitely everything that is a part of Ten of Swords. I also want to know, what are your comments and theories? Uh, let me know in the comments here below about this issue, about Ten of Swords uh, in general. I definitely enjoy seeing everybody commenting and letting me know your thoughts uh, as we all explore X-Men together. So thanks also to everybody at patreon.com slash comic book herald for ways to support my work at comic book herald and here on Crack and Krakoa on YouTube. In particular, thank you to the Mysterious Benefactors tier who is listed out there on the side. I'm Dave. You can find my stuff at comicbookherald.com at comicbookherald online. Look for the best comics ever in my Marvelous Year podcast for more from me. Thanks so much everybody for listening and as always enjoy the comics.